Have you ever wished that you could make more of a difference or an impact in the world, but you think, who am I? How would I even start? What could I possibly do? Well, if so, I hope today's interview is one that will be such an encouragement to you. In it, we're talking with author Sarah Bowling, author of the book, Hanging by a Thread, The Saving Moses Journey. In this interview, we're talking about a trip that Sarah took that would change her life forever and how she stepped up to help a very vulnerable group of people when no one else would. Hopefully throughout this interview, it will give you some great ideas for how you can help those around you as well as possibly those on the other side of the world and help you answer the question, who am I? What can I do? How can I help? All right. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for talking with us today. Will you start us off by just telling us a little bit about yourself and your background and um, a little bit about your organization, and how it came to be? Uh, my name is Sarah Bowling, and I live in Denver, Colorado, married 27 years. I have three kids who are teenagers, and my husband and I are pastors of a church here in Denver called Encounter Church. And I started a humanitarian organization for babies and toddlers. Um, not quite 10 years ago. So our aim is in international countries developing world where the, well, you see this, the need is most urgent and the care is least available. So I look for areas that have the highest infant mortality rate. I look for areas where no one is, is working or very, very few people, uh, organizations are involved. And that's where I uh, put down my flagpole. That's where I plant my flag. And so uh, I do malnutrition in areas that have severe acute malnutrition. I do something called birth aid. So we look after the neonatal, prenatal care, some obstetrics uh, for mothers who are in delivery in that process in very, very volatile areas that high, have high conflict in the Middle East. And then I do something called night care, which is I look after the babies and toddlers of sex workers in developing countries. So in America, we have daycare to look after babies and toddlers while their moms work. At the same way, we do this for babies and toddlers in developing worlds whose moms are sex workers. And those moms don't have another form of income. There's lots of organizations that help the moms, but there's not one organization that helps the babies and toddlers of these moms. And so this is who I am. I am saving Moses, um, and this is my passion. And I believe this is absolutely brings joy to the heart of God because it's looking after the least of the least, babies and toddlers around the world who have no voice um, and nobody to stand in the middle and say, hey, I want to stand up and make sure that you live, survive, and not just, you know, kind of barely cross the finish line, but thrive and have a hopeful future. So that's who I am, what I do, that's Saving Moses. So you have a brand new book that is, will have just released um, at the time that this recording goes live, Hanging by a Thread, The Saving Moses Story. And I um, started to look through it a little bit already. And in this book, you tell about a trip that you took to Ethiopia in 2009. Can you tell us a little bit about what, like why did you go on this trip in the first place and why it was so impactful for you? What did you see there? Sure, uh, I was on a missions team um, there were, I don't know, around 70 of us, and, and when I was there, I was out in a rural, far remote city, and uh, I was staying at an orphanage, and in the orphanage, um, there was newborns who had just been, been brought there, and the story on these newborn babies, these twin girls, uh, is that they had been left on a field, and that the police had rang this orphanage and said, hey, called them up and said, hey, can you take these newborns, and the orphanage said, no. It's not our policy. I remember hearing that thinking, what kind of orphanage turns away newborns? That does, it's like, you know, that doesn't make sense. And what the orphanage explained to me is, Sarah, we have limited resources. So we can take care of five 10-year-olds for the same quantity of resources that we take care of two one-year-olds. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, the light went on. And so when the Police called this orphanage. They said, no, we can't take them. And the police said to the orphanage, if you don't take these newborns, we'll put them back on the field because we have nothing else. We can't, we have no other recourse. So the orphanage was like, well, okay, we'll take them. And so when I visited them, those newborns were there like maybe just a couple days. And I held them in my arms. Their names were Sarah and Ruth. And I don't know how they were. They, you know, they're abandoned on a field. 
and I was completely unraveled. I'm a mom, and I just was like, oh my gosh, how does this happen? And that was the beginning of a major, major life-changing shift um, to see babies and toddlers and to think about, you know, Moses was in the Nile River. His life was hanging by a thread when he was like three months old, and this is in Exodus, and, and had Pharaoh's daughter not rescued him from the Nile River, um, you know, that would be a significant loss. And so I just think um, when Jesus talks about when you do this for the least of these, you do this for me, I see this very real in a very real experience expression for babies and toddlers because I think it's a phenomenal expression of God's genuine love for babies and toddlers, for all of us in humanity. I actually had the opportunity to hold an infant. Um, my kids are out of the infant stage now, but I know somebody who just had a baby recently and I just got to see the baby for the first time yesterday and like how special and, you know, like those warm, loving, motherly feelings of when you hold, like, I'm not sure how old she is, a few weeks old now. Um, but to imagine like if I saw a baby like that, on the side of the road here like there's no way that you would pass by a baby and just like let it sit out there and i'm imagining like this baby just sitting there on the side like, there's no way that you would let that happen here but there um i know you said the orphanage that you were at wouldn't take infants is that common across all of the orphanages um is that a widespread issue or was it just that particular um orphanage wasn't able to. I can't give you empirical data to say, you know, I've done a survey and this is, a, I haven't done that kind of research, but that's been my experience across the board. Um, and there's no cut on orphanages. Everybody does their part. Legitimately, everybody does their part because, you know, people need help. And so, and my little part is the zero to five-year-olds or babies and toddlers. So, um, I partner up with all kinds of organizations and if there's people who are like, hey, we want to bridge, you know, help you bridge from the five-year-old up and older, well, I partner with lots of organizations. So I think everybody does their part. Um, there's more than enough opportunity for us to be and express genuine love. So I found it to be true generally across the board and, and for orphanages, but again, there's always exceptions. I've never done empirical research. Um, I'm just trying to focus my energies and aim um, where the need is most urgent for babies and toddlers and where the care is least available. I love that. And it is a really good picture, too, of how God doesn't call all of us to the exact same. Like everybody has to care about this one cause, but he puts it on our hearts that each of us would care about something. Um, and then as we all work together and each of us cares about our various some things then everybody gets taken care of. Um, but I want to ask you, when you you say you went to Ethiopia, you saw this need, you said, you know, I have to do something about this. What were your next steps after that? Because I'm just thinking like, as a person, you know, I might see needs around me or maybe someday I'll go on a mission trip, but you know, how do you take the next step? How did you even start to even wrap your mind around, okay, how can I do something about this? Yeah, that's, that's like a really a phenomenal question. And uh, a lot of that, that's the journey in hanging by a thread is, you know, what do I do from here? And, and that was exactly what I did. I said, you know, here's babies and toddlers, you know, here's newborns on a field. What do I do? And with that passion, I just started to explore and see, well, what are some places, what are some areas where I can get connected, get involved? And I started looking and, and I, I felt something in my heart that was kind of, I couldn't necessarily put words around it until I started to explore and see, you know, what does that look like? And so in the book I talk about, I went to Costa Rica to kind of explore what, what, what do I see here? What, what are the needs? And all these trips I went, then I went to Albania and saw babies who had been abandoned in a, in a hospital. And that started to really kind of scope in a little closer. What's, what am I passionate about? I went to Haiti and did some infant immunizations there. And then finally that same year, I went to uh, Angola. And at that time, Angola had one of the highest infant mortalities in the world. And when I was there, I saw, I literally had a baby. My photographer donated blood for this baby, in, in Angelina, to, to survive, and she didn't. Um, and it still rips me up. It still rips me up. I write about it in the book. And, and uh, so I think part of my journey is just being willing to say yes and and letting God direct my steps, and letting God say, not this, but yes to this. 
And that's been my same journey um, when I developed night care. Because night care, nobody in the world is doing night care. Nobody's looking after the babies and toddlers of sex workers in all the world. There's lots of organizations that care for the moms, that care for, you know, do all kinds of medical care and, and vocational care and all that stuff. But these babies and toddlers, nobody's looking out for them. And what I found for these babies and toddlers of sex workers, more often than not, they're on the bed with mom as she's working. And you just kind of get, got to get your head around that because that's like, like, no, like that just, you just want to drop your teeth when you think about that. But that's their day-to-day -day reality. And so that's why we provide night care. And so I think it's just saying yes to God and, and what is on God's heart? What does God care about? What, is, what moves you? What compels you with compassion? What gets you amped up? <laughs> what gets you angry? What gets you upset? What, what do you find that's not acceptable? And then let God start to direct, direct some of that passion. And, you know, what, what, how do I feel? And the other thing I'd say, Brittany, is not everybody's wired up to be, you know, the knight in shining armor and take the charge. I think yet there's a lot of, a lot of teamwork for what God wants to do because God equips each of us in different ways. And so I have friends that are very administrative, very systematic, very structural, and I love them because it's not really me. <laughs> and they love me because they're like, woo, we like your, your intensity and you're like, let's get after it. And so it's a nice partnership and, I, and we don't compete, we complement. And so I think for each listener, for each person watching, I think we can say, I may not be that person, but I am me. And just because I'm me doesn't mean I'm disqualified. It means actually God has a unique design for who I am, how I'm organized internally, and I contribute. I'm a part of the family of God. You know, Paul talks about that. Eyes, ears. Not everybody's an eye. Not everybody's a foot. Not everybody's an eye or an ear. It takes all of us, and we all work together um, for God to work through us. All right. So the next thing I wanted to ask you as well, you say that God has a unique call on each of our lives. And I absolutely believe that as well. But how did you know that this organization or starting this organization was God's call on your life? Did you have like a moment where you were like, you felt God saying, you have to go create this organization and here's exactly what it's going to look like? Or was it just a matter of, hey, I have to do something. So let's start researching and figure it out like how did you know that this is what God wanted you to do I think for everybody it's unique how that plays out for me personally um, and I think it's by by kind of the personality how God has wired us up and for me um, I think my my internal wiring I'm very adventurous um, and I like to go explore uh, and I've always been that way. You know, I loved riding my bike when I was little, go outside and just ride for hours. I don't know where I was going, but I sure loved it. And so I think that's how God's organized me. And so doing this was, I don't know that I had some giant epiphany. I did have some moments, absolute moments of clarity. So for example, the name Saving Moses, um, that was, that absolutely came out of, um, one of my morning quiet times with God. Um, it wasn't me making it up or some marketing team that came together. Ooh, let's come up with something really savvy and cool. It was none of that. It was me sitting up in my, I call it my God chair, um, on the morning quiet time, kind of what I do on a routine basis and just listening to God and being present with God. Um, and then saying yes to that and saying yes to exploring. And I think sometimes we have this idea that it's going to look fine and smooth and all the you know, that's not going to be like forks in the road or, or kind of some winding paths. And uh, that hasn't been my experience. My experience has been winding paths and learning and growing and exploring in the process. And yeah, I've stubbed my toe and yeah, I've hit some dead ends and some brick walls. And I just find, I find that part of that is my journey with God and letting God work in inside of me and not just be always on the outside, what am I, what can I achieve? What can I accomplish? You know, where can I go? It's also some of that internal growing and mature. And, and I think some of it helps me nestle into Jesus a little more closely, um, which ultimately is a good thing, you know, based on <laughs> Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the strong man in his strength, 
nor the rich man in his wealth, but let him who boasts, boast that he knows me. And if that could be on my epitaph, I'd be all over that. Yeah, I've had a similar experience as well, where I never like had this revelation from God of, you must go start this website for Christian women. Um, I never set out to create like this whole thing and all the things that I, you know, I'm working on and will work on in the future. It was just a matter of, okay, here's something I can do. Here's something small. Um, and we'll take the first steps and you don't see all of the things you can do in the future. Um, you just kind of start with what's right in front of me. What needs do I see? Like if, even if you can't go to Ethiopia or Haiti or all these, all of these other places where, you know, it's awesome that you can, but you know, what needs are right in front of you? What can you do? And as you start to, begin to be the kind of person who answers God's call in these little ways, it opens up more doors and more opportunities for things you wouldn't have been able to do before. Um, and that's been really exciting as well, because you don't know where God's going eventually, but you just start right now um, and you kind of figure it out as you go. So you n mentioned that you had had, you know, you stub your toe on the way and there were obstacles. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the obstacles that you've had in setting up um, Saving Moses and what kind of trials have you had to overcome as you've built this? Yeah, I think probably maybe the biggest obstacle and trial to overcome still <laughs> is me um, because I find my my weaknesses and my shortfalls um, and sometimes my sometimes I have hesitation sometimes I, I I struggle in my thoughts you know I'll, I'll have some dark thoughts or I'll be discouraged have some emotional, some emotional down, downswells, you know, and I think, um, I think those are difficult things, and to ignore that, um, I don't think that's healthy, and I don't really think God wants us to ignore ourselves. <laughs> God is love. God loves us. Uh, that's a good thing. So I think one of the obstacles for me, and ongoing, is is in myself, and I think growing, growing myself. Um, my undergrad was in German and you're like, uh, I know exactly. My life is a little bit of these random kind of disparate. Where does that come from? But I find, so because of that, um, I don't, I don't want to be the lid. I don't want to be the hindrance or the obstacle. And so I want to grow. And for me not to be a lid or a hindrance, I have to grow. I have to improve. And so reading, you know, reading leadership books, getting around leadership people, um, being and going to places where I see needs. I was in Thailand recently and saw some pretty, pretty astounding things. And I think those growing things, you know, being an internally growing person is essential. And I think it's saying yes to God um, for us on the inside. But on the outside too, there are obstacles. I mean, I remember I had obstacles when the first time I agreed to do the malnutrition formula. There were six malnutrition clinics in Angola that I just instinctively, like impulsively said, yes, we'll pay for it. And I didn't have anything to pay for it. <laughs> My friend said to me, that's a boatload of bake sales and car washes, Sarah. It's $100,000 in one year. And I remember I was thinking, oh, what did I just commit to? You know, that impulsive leap and then look shoot and then aim that was kind of me um but when i said yes to it and i felt i felt god said i didn't feel god say woo i felt like god was pleased with that and within a couple months completely out of the blue um, we received a hundred and ten thousand dollar donation and i mean we had never been in front of anybody i talk about that in my book and some of these things where you just say yes to god and then watch God say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, honor your yes. I'm going to honor your obedience and I'm going to open up some doors for you that far exceed what you could know in your natural abilities or your natural planning. And so I saw it with money. I saw it in terms, I remember when I first tried to open night care, it was a disaster and the people were like, we're not doing that. Um, and they were very, very opposed to it. And so I tried a different country where I have a lot of friends and they're like, sweet, let's do that, Sarah. And I remember thinking, huh, that's a really opposite reaction to that first place. Um, but long story short, we opened five night care centers in that country. And then we started to open in different countries after that. And so I think some of the obstacles 
I think if we're not careful, we, we stop at the obstacle and maybe God's saying, if the door's closed, then try a different knob. You know, go down the hallway and see what other knobs could be open. And I think that willingness to be persistent, not just at the one door, but just persistent with what God's put in your heart. Maybe it's in a different place or in a different context or in a different way. Um, I think that's all very, very helpful. And it's just saying yes to, yes to God. I don't know how this works out. God's the method. And I'm just kind of the obedience with God's grace and help. Yes. Okay. Let's do it. But my first answer is yes. <laughs> and that's a great point too. I love how you said how the biggest obstacle is really you and all the things you need to work on internally, because I feel like it's so easy for people to see people like you um, who are, you know, involved in church and involved in missions and think, oh, it must come easy for them. Well, God just must have made, you know, them different or special. And um, they just know how to do these things. And it's not hard for them like it is for me. But every person has difficulties. I mean, I don't think it's I mean, I haven't done empirical research either, um, but I would highly doubt that there's anybody who would say, oh, that's really easy. And, you know, I just everything just works out like there's so many trials, no matter who you are or what you're doing. Um, but just trusting God to be able to start with a yes and say, yeah, I don't know how we're going to figure it out, but I trust you and we're going to figure it out. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about in your book, you had mentioned that you had a friend who was asking you some really hard questions. Do you remember that part of the book? And can you explore more on um, the benefits of having people around us to give us that feedback? I've had different friends ask me hard questions. Um, I remember when I first started, my friends who asked me the hard questions were my husband. Uh, hey, Sarah, where are you going to get that money? $100,000. Good luck with that. My mom said the same thing. Hey, good luck with that. Hard questions. Where are you going to get that money? Um, I've had hard friends ask me hard questions. They've had, I've been asked questions about night care. People ask me, well, you know, are you really just here to facilitate, to support prostitutes? Is that your end game? Um, that's a hard question because really at the end of the day, I look at it and I see babies and toddlers. Um, and those babies and toddlers are the core recipients, the first, like I, I'm on the front lines with those babies and toddlers. There's lots of organizations that help with the moms, help with the sex workers that, you know, and I mentioned that, but those hard questions. And I think hard questions like, you know, how come, and I remember my, like I said, my photographer who donated blood um, for Angelina and Angelina died. And that's a hard question. Why? Why are we here? Why do we, you know, that's a hard question. Um, and I don't, I think those are good questions and things that I wrestle, I still wrestle with them. I still wrestle with them. I had a, a seminary professor ask me when I came home from Angola after Angelina died. He didn't know, but he said to me, yeah, I bet you heard, because he heard I was on going to Angola and, you know, malnutrition and all that. He said, yeah, I bet you heard a lot of crying babies, because we were translating Psalms chapter 8, and it says the babies cry out in strength, depending on your translation." And um, I remember, he's like, yeah, I bet you. And I remember that question completely unraveled me because when you're in a severe, acute malnutrition clinic, it's deadly silent because there is no strength for those babies. So those kinds of questions, they, they, they still haunt me. They still um, rattle me. They still unnerve me. And they should. And I and I, I had somebody ask me one time, how come you how come you let yourself feel? Why don't you just protect yourself? And I don't I don't want to do that. I don't I don't think Jesus did that. I don't think Jesus protected himself in the Garden of Gethsemane and said, you know, he sweat as if drops of blood. He felt. He wept. I, I I think it I think genuine love is I don't want to say welcomes but acknowledges the hard questions and the tension and the emotional struggle that goes into it and the care. Um, so I think I don't I think hard questions I I don't think we should shy away from those. And sometimes the answers are difficult, 
And sometimes it tells us more about ourselves than the actual situation, what's in me. And that's a hard thing to come to terms with, is what's in you? Uh, a lot of us don't want to do that. But I think without coming to terms, without accepting that what's inside, it's hard for us to get close to Jesus and have an intimate day-to-day -day walk with Jesus without some of those hard questions. So let me ask you, because I know how easy it is to build up those walls and just not look and just, you know, close off ourselves to all of the hurts of the world. As we are opening our eyes up to see, okay, there are children who are being abandoned in fields and there are all of these problems all around us. How can we, how can everybody who is listening to this or watching this on YouTube right now, what are some very practical steps that we can take to say, okay, I'm not going to just close my eyes to the world's problems anymore. I'm ready to take some kind of first step. What kind of first step could we just super practical anybody could do? I think that's, I love that question. And I find it to be relevant um, for our daily existence. And I say that because, so let me give you this example. I was talking with a friend of mine yesterday. And he was telling me about his sister who lives in San Francisco. And he was, we were texting back and forth and he was really broken up. He said, you know, I really feel like I need to go visit my sister because she needs, she needs an intervention. Um, and this would be the second one. And this is my friend and, you know, probably I would known him from a gym, you know, like working out at the gym and there's nothing weird there, but you know, that guy's not really much into Jesus or any of that stuff. And so but I said to him, I felt when he told me that I could sense, you know, he cares about his sister. And I felt like I wanted to help him. And I said, you know, do you need, do you need a drive to the airport or transportation? Um, you know, what, what are some things? Or, and, and he was, he said, no, that's so gracious. Thank you so much. And I said to him, I said, well, do you mind if I just kind of check in a little bit, touch base and just see how you're doing? Um, and he said, I would really appreciate that. I appreciate your heartfelt uh, concern and compassion. And I think, you know, we look around the world and we say, well, you know, I can't go to Ukraine. I can't go to Namibia. I can't go to Somalia or whatever. But, but I think when we have these just in the day-to-day -day opportunities for compassion, somebody at our kid's school, you know, we're talking to a soccer mom, you know, one of the fellow team moms, Maybe we're in a class with another graduate student, or I think we all around us in our daily living, we have the opportunity to express compassion and to see, see stuff around us, see people around us. There are people that are homeless in my neighborhood or in my outside here on the main street. And there's one guy that I see and, and he, he, my heart goes out to him and I can't fix him. He's not a project. But I can have compassion. And from time to time, maybe I just bring him a meal. You're like, well, you're not helping him. He seems grateful for the meal. <laughs> you know, I just think these acts of compassion and having care about uh, people around us in our daily existence, regardless of how they respond or, you know, they don't, we don't transform them or change them. Or I, don't, I just think saying yes to compassion in our daily living is the perfect place to start. You don't have to go to Somalia and turn into Mother Teresa to be something magnificent. I think magnificent is in our daily choices. I love that. So unfortunately, we are out of time today, so we need to wrap up. But thank you so much for agreeing to come on to the podcast today and tell us more about your organization as well as just to speak about how we can get involved in all kinds of things around us. So thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Brittany. Really appreciate your time. All right, so that just about does it for today's interview. If you would like to hear more from Sarah, definitely check out her brand new book that just came out this month, Hanging by a Thread, The Saving Moses Journey. Not only will it open your eyes to a very real crisis that's happening all over the world today, but hopefully it will encourage you and inspire you to take action yourself right where you are. You may not be able to start a whole organization and save lives all over the world, but there is something God has for you to do right where you are. And it starts with just taking that first step. So definitely check out her book if you're interested in learning more. Look for ways 
around you, to be a good neighbor to those around you. And as always, if you have not subscribed to the Equipping Godly Women podcast, what are you waiting for? We come back regularly to share interesting interviews and tons of helpful tips and tricks to help you be all in as a Christian woman. So go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll talk to you again real soon. All right, bye.